The difference in people, the difference in performance, the difference in the final result, the outcome, is it usually dependent upon skill? Is that what makes one person better than another, yes or no? How many have seen someone with unbelievable innate skill get wiped out by an athlete, a person, a business individual who clearly had less skill? How many have seen this happen? Say, I. It's our ability to maximize. We said on day one, leaders are what transform organizations. You want to grow this company, you want to transform this company, leaders do it. A leader doesn't mean everybody else follows you, it just means that you have a higher what? A higher standard than anybody else does. What will make you the leader is when you have a higher expectation, not of other people, anybody can do that, of whom? Of yourself. So if you want to know what does it take to take things to the highest level, what's going to take to change my business permanently, not temporary, you can go home and you can install some of these strategies, skills, tactics, tools, insights, and see a significant change. But if that change is going to be a lasting company of value that keeps growing, then the things you've learned here have to become the standard for your organization, not something you did for a period of time. Whenever you look at somebody and say, why are they more successful than anybody else? It's always because of step one, they've raised their standard. If you go back home and you want to change your life in any way, personally, professionally, or your company, as boring as it sounds, as stupid as it ain't it sounds, you might say, I spent all this time, this energy, this money, and you're going to tell me to raise my standards? Yes. Because even though that's not sexy, it is the only thing that creates lasting change. You can go on a diet and you can lose weight, but what will that person eventually do? They'll go where? Back, unless they raise their standard. Now that sounds so trite and stupid and positive thinky or old school, but the truth is it's the truth. So maybe I can language it in a way that's more compelling to you or more simple. What does it mean when we say raise our standards? It means you turn your shoulds in the must. The difference in people is that they turn their shoulds into must. The things that you used to say I should do, you do your shoulds when it's convenient, when it's comfortable, when it goes your way. But when something is a must, not to other people, but a must to you, do you find the way to get it done, yes or no? So the difference in people is what's their must, or another word for that is what's their standard. Every person in this room right now, our bodies are a reflection of our physical standards. They are not a reflection of our desires. Many, most people have a desire for more energy or a better body or a stronger body or a more fit body. We don't get our goals, we get our musts. The ones that are the must become how you are. And guess what? It shows up in your rituals. When it's a must, you have different rituals, different things you do consistently when you must have your body a certain way than you should or you'd like to or you ought to. How many followed I'm talking about here? Say I. So whether we want it or not, the only way to change your body long term is change what the must is for you. Now, I'm not telling you what it should be. Who the hell am I? I'm just saying maybe it's time for you to take a look. Because many times you set the standard a long time ago or you lost the standard completely because most of us base our standards by our environment. Who you spend time with is who you tend to become. So if everybody around you is gaining a little weight or everybody around you is you know, constantly tired. After a while, even if you had high energy, you don't want to make fun of them or tease them or make them feel bad. So gradually, subconsciously, you lower your own Saturn just a little bit. And that little bit is that old metaphor, overused but true. You take a frog and put him in boiling water, what's he going to do? Jump right out. But if you put him in and turn the water up real slowly over time, it'll boil to death. That's most people's lives, isn't it? And it's usually because you haven't remembered the power of who you spend time with. Who you spend time with is who you become. So one of the things that's great about this five days is you found people from all over the world who are all absolutely committed to go day and night, night and day, literally, sometimes with food, sometimes without, <laughs> but whose standard was, I'm here to maximize who I am, what I'm about, what I'm going to take home, what I'm going to create. That raises your game. Remember, play against somebody you're better than, your skills are going to go down. Play against somebody better than you, just to stay on the court, the game has to go up. Want to change your life? Raise your standard. Want to raise your standard the most? Get around where it's better. Surround yourself with people playing the game much higher than you are. So just to be around them, your game has to rise. 
that's part of what we try to do. When we come into a company, we create that by raising the standard amongst them. Or oh, you got to do it by yourself, but you got to do it. How many agree with me on this? Say I. And it starts with whom? It starts with us. So raise the standard. I remember when I met Michael Jordan for the first time, and it was while he was still with the Bulls. And I asked him. I got a chance to do some coaching a bunch of people, and I think I introduced him because of this. And I said, Michael, I said, how is it you do this? I mean, you're the best that's ever lived at this stage. I got to ask the same question of Wayne Gretzky. And interesting, Wayne Gretzky, I'd read someplace and he gave me the same answer. I asked him the same thing. You're not the fastest. You're not the strongest. You're not, you know, you don't, how is it you're the great one when you're not the fastest, the strongest, the quickest? And he said, well, Tony, I appreciate the compliment, but he said, I, I think one of my advantages is most people skate to where the puck is and I skate to where the puck is going. The power of what? Anticipation. He knows the pattern. With Jordan, his standard was, I asked him, he said, you know, Tony, everybody, you know, I said, what, what makes you the best? Is it natural ability? Is it talent? Is it skill? Is it God-given? Is it strategy? What is it? He said, Tony, I think I can say this to you without it sounding like hyperbole. He said, I have got unbelievable natural skills. But he said, study my history and you'll know why I am who I am. I did not make the high school varsity team when I was a sophomore in school. High school, I got cut. He said, I had a lot of natural talent, but the greatest gift of my life was a coach who said, you're not on the team. And I looked at him, I like, laughed at him. I said, you gotta put me on the team, I'm the most talented guy out there. He said, no, you're not. He said, you have a lot of natural talent, but you have no heart, no absolute commitment, no real drive, you're not on my team. And it just crushed him. And finally he negotiated and he said, look, you wanna be on my team next year? Simple, meet me every morning before school, for a one-on-one -on -one practice, and I'll take this raw talent and I'll teach you discipline. I'll show you how to raise your standard. And if you show up the whole year, I'll guarantee you a spot next year. And if you don't, probably the same outcome's gonna happen when you try out next year. He couldn't believe it. And guess what, most people don't know, Michael Jordan got up every morning and drilled and drilled and drilled and didn't get to be on the team. And next year he was on the team and he was not only good, he was great. Guess when his career exploded? When he lost again the championship to Detroit. And he was on the bus, he said, he was crying in the back of the bus, physically crying, pissed off at all the other players that they hadn't done their job. And something inside of him snapped and realized, crying, whining, blaming everybody else is not the problem. I need to raise my... Because he realized that's what did it for him originally. And you know what he did that year? He lifted weights. Like never in his entire life, he decided he was going to dominate every person, every person, every floor, every place, every spot in the country. He's going to be stronger than anybody. He practiced like he'd never practiced in his life. And oh, by the way, he won how many NBA championships? How many in a row? Three. Retired, came back and won how many in a row? Three. Never anybody in history would even dream of such a thing. Especially after retirement. That's the power of raising your standard. But guess who he competes with? Michael told me one time, he goes, Tony, if I competed with other people, I wouldn't be who I am. He said, my competition is with the best I can be. They're trying to compete with me. That's why I beat them. Because they're competing with where I am. But I'm competing with where I can be. Think about that mindset. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself. Not your people, yourself, to that level. How things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. It's like when Gary Vee was here and he was guys were saying, man, I'm working so hard, man. I work from nine to six. He goes, yeah, what are you doing from eight to two? 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. That's when you master your craft. I always say to people, it's what you practice in private that you'll be rewarded for in public. People say, oh my God, you know, you have this great ability, this great skill. They didn't see all the hours. This class, this course, I know tons of this stuff like the back of my hand. But if you talk to my team who's exhausted, They'll tell you we're up to 4 a.m. almost every night. To be able to figure out how to provide for you a life cycle and get it to be real so you can think about Nike and have give you accurate information about when did they really get to young adult, when did they fall down. We had to make phone calls, read financials, do all kinds of stuff. We did all that stuff. We were doing all these things and we accomplished so much and I figured out how to make it even better. That level of commitment is what makes you great at what you do and gives you that little edge that makes you stand out from everybody else. And that standing out is what makes somebody absolutely own an industry or brand themselves like nobody else in the world. That process is what this is about. 
raise your standard. When you gotta go home, you gotta say, where are we gonna raise the standard? What am I gonna take that's been my should and make it absolute must? Where are we gonna do that as a team and how are we gonna pull it off? Now, who here has ever, by the way, your income right now is a result of your standards as well. It's not the industry and it's not the economy. Who here is making more money today than you made 10 years ago? Let me see your hands. How many feel like it's not enough today? Let me see your hands. And how could that be? Real estate's so cheap now. Computers are cheaper than they were then. You get so much more for your money. Because once you achieve a level, who knows what happens? You immediately, you close the gap, you create a new gap. That's because that's what makes us grow. Who's willing to go back to where you were 10 years ago? Not many, some of you, you would be because it's gotten worse in the last 10 years for you. But the majority, there's no way. See, once you're fortunate enough, if you don't like cleaning house, once you're fortunate enough to have somebody clean your toilets, you will not be doing that again, unless you like that. You'll find somebody who loves cleaning toilets and you'll pay them handsomely. Because now to go back and do that, once you've had the privilege of not having to do that, it's a different game, it's a gross metaphor, but who gets what I'm talking about here? Say I. Once you have a must, you find a way to get to it. Every one of you in this room is earning what you must earn, not a dime more. Don't get me wrong, you might have big goals, big desires, but it's not a must for you. Because even when the economy crunches, if it's a must, you will find the way. How many agree with me on this? Say I. I. See, when it was a must for me to get at one level, I did. I remember I, it was a must for me to finally make a million dollars a year. I had my son Jarek going to be born. I swore I would never have a child unless I was financially set. And I wasn't financially set. And he was on his way. I went from $38,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in the next 12 months. That was all BS. In my head, I thought all my growing up, all the pain was because my parents fought because there was no money. They would have fought anyway. Because I believed that, though. I raised the standard and made it happen. And then I made a million dollars a year for seven straight years. Even though I built five more companies, even though I was helping more people, I made the same amount of money. Guess why? That was my must. At some level above that, seemed greedy. Now, it wasn't like I had this incredible lifestyle. I owned a magical home. I had this place called the Del Mar Castle overlooking the ocean in Del Mar, California. But I was on the road, staying at the Ramada Inn in Milwaukee <laughs> with shag carpeting and smelly, you know, dead animals on the wall on my birthday. And my maid, she's back at home in the castle going, oh, Mr. Robbins, happy birthday. Oh, I can't help thanking you. It's so wonderful. Oh, Mr. Robbins, it's so beautiful here. I was sitting out in the jacuzzi overlooking the ocean. <laughs> Oh yes, oh, I've lost 22 pounds. I can't tell you, it's been so amazing. I get on your Stairmaster and I watch Oprah. I love your gym, Mr. Robbins. And I'm thinking, she's got a multi-million dollar lifestyle. How many can relate to this in some way, right? So I went from 38,000 to a million because so I changed my income. It became an absolute what? It was nothing about money. It was about growing. Because I knew to make more, I'd have to help more people. I'd have to expand. And I came with this goal, I wanted to feed all the people in San Diego that were homeless, first my goal was a third of the homeless people, and then my goal was everybody. I said, if I can go from 38,000 to a million, I should be able to go from a million to three million in three years, and I did it in 12 months. I found the why, I found the reasons, I got a different RPM. But it became a must for me, not a should. You're meeting your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they could possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. When you leave here, get clear on your must. Or raise your what? Step two, real fast. I'm going to do it real fast. Who here has ever raised the standard and you get out there and you go, I'm going to go do this. And I'm committed. I'm going to change this. I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I'm going to take my company to the next level. And you're all excited. And then all of a sudden, this voice in your head goes, who are you kidding? <laughs> Who's ever had one of these? Raise your hand. Say, I. So once you raise your standard, you got to get certainty behind it. You can sustain it. And that means you got to change your limiting beliefs. You got to change your limiting beliefs. And who has limiting beliefs, by the way? Who? Everyone does. So you got to become aware of it and you got to destroy it. Now, how to do that? Honestly, if you've been to the UPW, you know how. If you haven't, come to join me in San Jose or someplace else and come through the experience. When you change your limiting belief, everything changes. Because as you believe, so is it done unto you. If you believe you're right, you believe you're wrong, you're right. Because whatever you're certain about, you find a way to support it. I always teach people to exercise. Try this. And if you know it, do it fresh. Look in this room real fast for everything that's brown in this room. I'm going to give you a test. What's brown? Quick, look for brown, look for brown, look for brown, brown hair, brown clothing, brown. 
Close your eyes. Tell me everything you saw in this room that's red. Raise your hand if you see more brown in your head than red and say, I. Open your eyes. Now look for red. 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 Look everywhere for red. Look for red. Raise your hand if you found more red this time. Raise your hand. Say, I. Why? Because you're looking for it. Because whatever you focus on, you'll find. In fact, you'll find stuff that's not there. How many saw beige? Called it brown just to feel successful. <laughs> How many saw burgundy? Called it red just to feel successful. See, once you believe something is a certain way, out of your need for certainty, you'll change things to meet that belief. Let me show you in two seconds flat why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I call it the success cycle. Real fast. Draw yourself four squares. Put them up on the screen here. You'll see, as I do this, take a quick look. You'll notice you've got the word potential up in the left-hand square. Up in the right-hand square is the word action. Bottom right is the word results. Bottom left is the word belief, or another word for that would be a sense of certainty. Potential, action, belief, results. And notice there's arrows in a clockwise fashion where they just keep feeding each other over and over and over again. So again, it's potential, action, results, belief, or another word for that would be certainty. Now, do you ever notice how rich people tend to get richer and poor people to get poorer? And I don't just mean rich in financial terms. I mean... People that are rich emotionally, do you ever notice how happy people tend to get happier? And depressed people tend to get more depressed? How many have found this to be true? Say I. It's because of the power of momentum and what I'm about to show you. So let me show you something here. What's the potential of any human being? You tell me, quick. Unlimited. Do most people's results reflect that true potential? Yes or no? No way. Why? Because most people aren't taking enough what? But is it possible to take a lot of action and still get lousy results? What if you got a salesman that works for you and they walk out and they knock on a hundred doors and they say, you wouldn't want to buy anything from me, would you? <laughs> or they don't say that verbally, but they say it non-verbally. Is that going to affect their results? Yes or no? So it's not enough even to take enough action because when we believe it's not going to work or we're uncertain, does that affect how much of our potential we tap? Yes or no? See, if you don't think it's going to work, you're not going to put out a bunch of your energy when you think it's going to fail. And by the way, when you're not sure, you tap a little potential. Do you take little or a lot of action? When you're not sure, when you think it's not going to work, do you take massive action or little action? Now, when you take little potential with little action, what kind of results do you get? Little, lousy results. And when you get lousy results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you it wasn't going to work. Told you it was a waste of time. And then, by the way, when you have less belief, how much more potential do you take, more or less? If it's possible, you tap less potential, more or less action, less. And what happens to your results? They get even what? And now they got worse results, what does that do to your belief? And by the way, now you see the current economy. Isn't it true? Everybody out there is going, oh my God, the results are so bad, it's gonna get worse in the future. So I better pull in my horns, there's less potential, so I'm not going to push as hard. I'm not going to take much action. Oh my God, I'm getting lousy results with little potential of action. Oh my God, it's going to get worse. That's what creates a recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. How do you change that? By the way, can it work the opposite direction? What would happen if something inside you gave you so much certainty inside of you that you felt absolutely certain that recession was your friend? that the worst economy for you was the greatest time on earth, and all you had to do is manage your state and apply your fundamentals and immerse, stay coached so you don't get off the target, keep taking action, and you could own your business and you go to other people's businesses. How many believe that, by the way, now? Say, I. When you have that kind of certainty, are you going to use more of your potential when you go home or less? Which one, my friends? Are you going to take less or more action? When you are certain and you use lots of your potential with massive action, what kind of results do you get? Massive action gets massive results. What kind of belief do you get now when you get better results? You go home, you use your core story. You go home, you take one of these techniques, you get a different response. You go home and you stimulate a new source of profit or income. You go home and you add a service. You go home and do anything. And it works. Your brain goes, yeah, it works. Now, by the way, at Home X, we went in there. Thank God we went in there because they took our stuff and it looked like it wasn't working. Do you remember that? because some people there didn't want the change to happen. So we had to dig in and find it was working. 
We knew you can't take action. You can't sow that seed and reap nothing. So we uncovered what was really going on. You're going to have to watch for the same thing, depending upon the size of your organization. But bottom line, when you get great results, belief gets stronger. Now you're totally certain. Are you going to use more or less potential, my friends? Which one? More. You're going to take even more what? Get an even greater what? Even more certainty. And now what happens to your business? Boom, 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 boom. And now you have a different momentum. And so your economy does not have to reflect the economy. You get to create your economy. You get to decide whether you freeze to death or ski or snowboard. It's winter, but you can have the best time of your life. It could be a sunny, beautiful, magical time. But what you got to do is you got to manage this process. In order to do it, you got to change your limiting beliefs. And this week has been about doing that by giving you so many tools and examples that you'd be immersed. But I promise you when you go home, all this is going to be tested. A, because all the stuff that's waiting for you after being gone for five days. B, all the people there you work with, their limiting beliefs, whether you have one employee or two because you're in an army of one or two people, or whether you got 10,000. And so you have to be able to implement. This, by the way, is, I'm going to sell you, bring us in if we can help. Do you think we could help? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Bring us in and we'll do it. Or get your team together and find a way to make sure this momentum goes in the right direction. Make sense? Yes. This is the must. If you have this high standard, but you don't really believe because the momentum's in the wrong direction, having the tools will be worthless. That's where certainty that's where everything else we teach, that's what I do in my events, that's where you guys have been there before, that's what you gotta bring to the table. What are the five keys for integrating this? Number one, you gotta go home and raise your what? Come on guys, raise your what? Which means turn your shoulds into? Step number two, you gotta go out and change your limiting what? Find anything that's limits you and destroy it. What's the fastest way to destroy it? You can do it very quickly by producing the results in your mind over and over again or why do you think I get people to walk on fire? Because they think it's impossible. When they walk in this fire, mentally you might say, oh, I can do it. But when they get in front of that fire and it's 2,000 degrees burning hot coals, it gets their full attention. <laughs> and suddenly they have a state change. And when you get yourself in a state where you can storm through fire, it's not about fire walking. The state you're in to get yourself to walk across fire is the metaphor for anything that used to stop you, the fire of your life. And by the way, when you cross fire, and you're on the other side doing something you once thought was difficult or impossible, it's that easy, your brain goes, what else can I do that I thought was impossible? It's unbelievable, it's not intellectual, it's emotional. Plus, after fire walking, cold calling is not a problem. <laughs> and then there's the final fifth step. And that fifth step's really simple, my friends. And that is, step up and give. Step up and give more than anyone else could possibly expect. The ultimate transformation happens when you stop trying to get and you start to give. Whenever you're at your best, you're giving. I remember so vividly driving in my car, my Volkswagen Bug, and I was struggling, and I was 19 years old. I was driving on a freeway in San Gabriel Valley, the 210 freeway, I'll never forget. And it's midnight, and I'm frustrated. I felt like I tried everything, and I had these big hits, like the one you just saw and nothing was going my way, and I was frustrated, and I kept thinking, how come I'm not getting what I want? And all of a sudden, it just hit me on the freeway. I pulled over the side, it was almost midnight, no cars really around, grabbed my journal and I wrote, and I still have the journal to this day from when I was 19 years old, full page, and I wrote, the secret to living is giving. And I realized why I wasn't doing well. Because I all focused about what I wasn't getting. I was not focused on what I was not giving. And the whole game changed.